something to say. Hello everyone, and welcome to this episode of Project Shadow. My name's Charlie. You might know me better as sci-fi fantasy writer C.E. Dorset. and if my voice sounds a little weak, I recorded six chapters of the audiobook for Crucify My Love today, and yeah, my voice is a little weak. Sorry. Um, but hopefully that will that project will be done soon and out to the world so you all can experience it. I'm very excited. So today... I wanted to talk with you about something that's really been bothering me lately, and that's canon. You know, canon, that thing, that immutable thing, that golden law of the universe where the gods met with the creators of the franchises that we love and hammered out the rules by which the cosmos shall be governed, the histories by which the universes shall be built, and the events that shall have happened in them. Yeah. No, that's not what happened. And that's where I'm really getting irritated about this. Look, I am a canon stickler. I like when stories are consistent. And I like when stories build off of each other and show a very detailed and beautiful world. But... <sighs> And this goes to my problem that I'm having with a lot of the discussions occurring in modern fandom. Canon is more often than not being wielded as a weapon. You know, like everything is nowadays. And it's not being used for what it's intended to be. So let's start by talking about Star Trek. Because Star Trek canon is a very strange, weird, and amorphous thing. Why do I say that? Because, unlike other fandoms, there isn't an official Star Trek canon. Okay, are the gasps complete yet? I know some people are going to really take umbrage with me saying that. And I have already written my lines that I will not tell lies. But there isn't. There, there, there isn't. We have broken up what we consider canon into the Alpha timeline, the Beta timeline, and the Kelvin timeline. The Alpha being anything that happened on the TV shows, asterisk. The Beta being anything that happened in the video games or the books or any of the ancillary media, asterisk. And the Kelvin timeline being what happened in the J.J. Abrams movies. So that'd be Star Trek, Star Trek Into Darkness, and Star Trek Beyond. That doesn't get an asterisk. <laughs> but it maybe should, because they do comment on things that happened b before the Kelvin split. So, okay, fine, asterisk. The issue with this is, unlike... Star Wars. And I kind of almost wish that CBS would have just done what Star Wars did and announce this is canon before they created Star Trek Discovery. Because they're relying on us to interpret what exactly is and is not in the set of rules that they're pulling from. Now when I say that, pretty much you can assume if it's in any of the Star Trek encyclopedias or related media created by Michael Okuda or any of the others, it's probably canon because he's pulling all of his information from the TV series. Asterisk. Now, why does that get an asterisk? Was the TV, was the animated series canon? And I'm going to ask probably the most blasphemous question that can be asked by a Star Trek fan. Was the original series canon? You know, the 1965 through 68 TV series that was all bright and technicolor? Now, we can argue it's canon because in Trial and Tribulations, when our heroes go back in time, they interact with events from that original series. 
Jean didn't really consider it canon. And this is where I get really snarky about things. Because two things get evoked at the exact same time, especially with Star Trek fandom. And this is one of the things that makes Star Trek fandom very different from Star Wars fandom. Whereas you will almost never hear a Star Wars fan other than myself say things like, well, that's the way George wanted it without being sarcastic because, you know, George Lucas created Star Wars and that's the way he wanted the prequels. That's the way he wanted the Clone Wars to be. That's the way George wanted it. The edits and recuts of the movies that came out, whether you like them or not, George created the series and that's the way George wanted it. That to me is the simple definition of canon. It's the version that the creator wanted. The version that the creator put out. See, what a lot of Star Trek fans are not aware of is Gene Roddenberry saw very clearly that Star Trek The Motion Picture was a reboot of Star Trek. In the novelization, which I highly recommend that you write, read if you are a Star Trek fan, Gene Roddenberry wrote it. We actually have Kirk reminiscing about things that happened prior to the movie and talks about how they are remembered wrongly. That they were remembered with more color and exaggerated action than what really happened. You see, the Captain Kirk in the novel, written by Gene Roddenberry, which of course is not canon because it's not a TV, one of the TV shows, but it was created by the creator, casts doubt on the original series because it over-exaggerated the heroics of the characters. And when you watch... The, the motion picture, and everything that came out after it, you can see a very clear tonal shift from the original series to everything that followed. Everything that followed takes many more of its cues from the motion picture, The Wrath of Khan, which is kind of the second reboot of Star Trek, where, okay, begrudgingly, we're going to bring back some of the original series right? But the Khan that we meet in The Wrath of Khan is distinct from the Khan that we met in Space Seed. Again, Gene Roddenberry didn't have a precious sense of canon for the original series. That might upset people, but that's what was going on in Gene's head. Gene talked about that a lot. He rebooted the series with the motion pictures. And if you actually watch The Next Generation, that show is much more like the movie track than it is like the original series at all. This led to a lot of disputes. And, you know, the classic, who do you like better, Kirk or Picard? It's a ludicrous question to ask, to be sure. But the whole point of it is that the differences between the original series and the next generation are stark. And it's because the next generation takes place in the timeline in the canon set by the movies, which develops the Vulcans and makes them into a fully fledged race, which they were not in the original series. It embraces the Klingons from the movies, not the Klingons from the, from the original series. It does this repeatedly. And this is the problem with canon. Star Trek does not have a rigidly defined canon. It has a fan-defined canon. It has three sets of fan-decided canons. And so, when I put asterisks on things, is the animated series canon? Is Star Trek the animated series canon? That may seem like a weird question, but think about it for a minute. Gene Roddenberry did the series. Many of the writers from the original series came back to reprise, to write episodes for it. Many of the actors from the original series came back to voice their characters in the animated series. 
and several things that happen later refer back to things from the animated series and draw them into canon. If we're going to call the TV series and the movies canon. The only reason it's usually pushed off to the side is it's not a live action series. And we as fans have defined canon for Star Trek to be the live action series and movies. And the reason I keep saying we, the fans, decided this is unlike the Lucasfilm story group, which made a pronouncement. All of the films are canon, as well as the Clone Wars television series and movie. Oh, and the novelizations of the movies are canon. But you didn't know that. <laughs> A lot of Star Wars fans don't, because I quote the book sometimes, and they're like, oh, that's not, no, no, no. Lucas Story Group very clearly states that the novelizations for the movies are canon. So, having said that, and of course everything that they've created since is canon, but they define that. They put that restriction on themselves. They're the ones that determined this is what we're holding on to as canon. Well, the movies after J.J. obviously didn't. And I'm not just talking about the Kelvin timeline. If you actually watch the original series, Kirk talks a lot about his time at the Academy, various people he interacted with, and what kind of a person he was. And yes, we can say that what happened to the USS Kelvin may have changed the course of his life, but Kirk defines himself as a bookworm in the Academy. He was kind of nerdy and was picked on by the other people. In fact, he had a bully that used to harass and beat him up all the time. Yeah, that's Captain Kirk. Captain Kirk was a dweeb. And because we're meeting Captain Kirk at roughly the time he should have been in the Academy and kind of is in the Academy in the Kelvin movies. That's the Captain Kirk we should have met. Yeah, we can make some alliance, uh, some allowances because the Kelvin timeline has changed things. But that's the Kirk that we have. That's not the Kirk that we want to imagine, though. It really isn't the Kirk that we know. The Kirk that we know is the Kirk who is now captain and who has been through so much and developed that internal strength. But his backstory is very different than the one that most people are probably familiar with. Is that backstory still canon? Well, the movie shows us a James T. Kirk who was stealing cars and being rather roguish from a very young age. This is not the James T. Kirk from the original series. So is it just ignoring the original series? Or is it changing his character in canon? And that's where we have to be very, very, very careful about anything that we make proclamations about as being canon or not. We don't have anything... I've said this once, I'm going to say it probably a thousand times. We don't have anything like the Lucasfilm story group in Star Trek. We don't. Maybe we should. That's a discussion for a whole other day, because mm, I, I don't know how that would work. Because I really don't want it centered at Paramount, and I really don't want it centered over in CBS. But until then, until we actually have that, the borders for what goes into canon and what doesn't is murky. All we have is hearsay. A lot of the elements that people rely on for determining the stats of engines and history are what was said by other characters. And that could be reliable and it could be unreliable. For example, Anything that Scotty said because of his appearance on the episode Relics of The Next Generation needs to be taken with a grain of salt because we know that, like the Doctor, Scotty lies. That's how he kept and maintained his reputation. 
So how much of any of the information gleaned from Scotty should ever be considered as canon? Now, one of the reasons why I'm talking about this a lot today is with Star Trek Discovery, things are being pushed back and forth and back and forth. And a lot of discussion is centered around whether and how and how much Discovery has broken canon or deviated from canon or ignored canon. And I'm one of those people that, you know, I, I do wish it would fall a little bit more in line, but I, not for the same reasons that most other people are probably saying it. I just, I want it to be an ensemble show. They've introduced me to a lot of interesting characters that I'm not getting the opportunity to learn about. I want to know who they are. So let's take the holograms. The holograms are a big bone of contention when it comes to Star Trek Discovery. That's something we don't see on other ships. Disagree. E.C. Henry did a wonderful video about this, and I highly recommend that you go check out his YouTube channel if you're not familiar with him. Um, he did a wonderful video where he looked at the technology of the original series and how it was actually much more advanced than we thought that it was. And one of the things that he points out is, by the time we get to the next generation, it's clear that the view screen on the Starship Enterprise is actually a holographic projector. And the way we know that is, well, we get side views. When the camera is looking at Kirk, I'm sorry, looking at Picard from the side, we see whoever he's talking to on the screen from a side angle. We don't see them as a distorted front-facing camera image. It's a holographic communication system. And when you look at the actual screens and whatnot that we're given, in the original series, there's a very good argument to be made that those were actually small holographic systems that were projecting their hologram within the screen, much like the screen on the bridge of the Enterprise. We actually don't know if the screen on the Enterprise, the main viewer on the original Enterprise in the original series, was holographic or not, because it's always filmed straight on. We don't get any side views of it, so we don't know if it was holographic or not. The other screens, though, there's good argumentation to say that they were holographic and not just a straight-on image. Now, if that's true, and again, that's all argumentation that... I'm not going to go into E.C. Henry's argument because he does such, such a good job with it. Please go check out his YouTube channel if you want the full argumentation there. But if you accept that li line of argumentation, that means that they had holograms during this time period. Oh, and the animated series, they have holograms. They have hollow projectors. In fact, they have hollow projectors they're able to set up outside in the open and project large scenes around them. Mm. Now that's a point that needs to be taken into consideration when we're talking about this. The t See, one of the things that has been fascinating to me when watching Discovery is they tend to, they, well, they seem to be taking the animated series as canon. There are a lot of things that they have referenced from the animated series, including when Spock ran away from home, some of the troubles that Spock had. Those are all actually episodes of the of the animated series. That's a reference to the animated series. In fact, Sarek's house looks a lot like the house depicted in the animated series, which leads me to believe that they are taking the animated series as canon. Since most other people don't, that makes anything that appears in Discovery that is referencing something from the animated series look like it's violating canon. But again, we have no strict rules for this world as to whether or not any of this should or should not be considered canon. And therein lies the rub. This is the problem. Yeah, I... Don't take, me, don't take what I'm saying out of context. And what I'm trying to argue is not 
that I don't want consistency in my fictional worlds and that I don't want their histories to line up and to make sense. I think there are a lot of problems with the Klingons, and I'm hoping that those get resolved. Why can Laurel be Chancellor of the High Council when Lursa and Bator could not? That's a major plot point that differs between Discovery and The Next Generation, though there is quite a bit of time in the intervening years for that rule to crop up for some reason, and maybe Laurel ruined it for everyone. Maybe Laurel is the reason why you can't have Lursa or Bator be leader of the High Council and why they have to go and hunt down Terrell. But yeah, I that that does kind of bother me a little bit. But maybe they just decided, let's not make the Klingons sexist in that way. I don't know. And th they just decided to throw that out. Do we know that Lursa and Bator couldn't sit on the council? Do we know that they couldn't govern? Could Gowron, knowing that Lursa and Bator existed, have changed the laws of the Empire so that women couldn't sit on the council? Because in Sins of the Father, there are clearly women on the High Council when Worf's on trial. Maybe Gowron changed the rules. See, I can make a headcanon out of that, and I can find a way to excuse that away. If I want to. And that's the thing. Canon should not be used to wallop a fandom over the head. I've been seeing this happen with everything lately. People trying to use canon against trying to use canon against Star Wars. I've seen them try to use it against J.K. Rowling and her Wizarding World. I've seen people try to use it against just name fill in the blank show that has a continuity predating what's currently coming out. And yeah, that could be a valid discussion. Was Obi Wan wrong when he described his Anakin to Luke? He may have just been telling Luke what he thought Luke needed to hear. We know that Obi Wan did that all the time. So to take Obi Wan's word as gospel when he describes his initial encounters with Anakin, maybe we shouldn't do that. Maybe we should have a healthy distrust of any character who's giving us details about the world prior to the story that they currently inhabit. Yes, I want these worlds to make sense, but at the same time, I don't want to live in a world where fans are saying, you are not allowed to like this thing because I have found it objectionable based on this one thing or this constellation of things that comprise all holy canon, and thus your enjoyment is wrong. And I've had this discussion on many levels about a lot of different topics when it comes to fandom, but I, I feel like I'm going to have to say this over and over again until it sinks into people's heads. People are allowed to enjoy whatever they enjoy. You know what? There are times when I've actually put on that Suicide Squad movie and watched it. Yeah, I have. I'll be honest. I have watched it just for thrills. Because, you know what? Sometimes I just want to see Harley Quinn hit something with a baseball bat. Is that a good movie? No. Would I defend it and fight for its quality? No. But I have watched it more than once. I'm not saying that we shouldn't defend the quality of the series that we're in, but we have to remember the fundamental rules of the universe we exist in. This is a capitalist system, and I know we like to think that that gives us some kind of a power over the creators and rights holders, but it doesn't. The prequels were not made for people like me who grew up watching Star Wars, or for people older than me who were around when the first movie came out. first movie came out months before I was born. That's not who the prequels were made for. The prequels were made for kids. And you know what? The kids that were alive when those movies came out liked them. 
And that's the same thing with resistance and what's going on. Now, I'm not saying that Star Trek Discovery is made for the kids and the kids love it and you're just being an old fuddy-duddy. Don't think I'm saying that. But remember, these are products of corporations that exist to make money. They are going to do whatever they think will make them the most money. And I'll tell you right now, they don't care if we complain about canon. They don't care if we complain about consistency. They don't care if we complain that it's not the show I grew up with. They don't care about us. They just don't. They care about money. We recently watched Aquaman, and I'm still debating whether or not I'm going to do an episode on it or talk about it at all, because I have feelings, but I'm letting him congeal. But whether you liked that movie or not, like, I've got a friend who went to the theater, saw it, really didn't like it, and is now frustrated because it's going to get a sequel. Yes, it's going to get a sequel. It made a billion dollars. That's what they care about. All of those reviews by the critics, they don't care all of those user reviews saying bad things about it, they don't care. It made a billion dollars. They're going to make more. That's what it is. It's an industry that wants to make money. It's simple. It's straightforward. That's all there is to it. They don't care about our feelings. And so I know it feels like we have a marketplace of ideas and we should be able to argue and boycott and do all of those things to rein in those corporations that control the intellectual property that we have invested emotionally into. But we can't. They don't care about us. They care about the money. And as long as they're making money, they're going to keep doing what they're doing. So please don't use fandom against others and don't use canon against others. I'm just tired of it. We can have debates. I, I'm all for debating how things fit into canon and stuff. I think those discussions are fun. But lately, I've been seeing a lot of content coming out. Where people are saying, this is exactly how this one thing violates canon, and thus anybody who liked it is stupid. And I'm not going to stand for that. Like what you like, as long as it doesn't hurt anybody. <laughs> if it doesn't hurt anybody, it doesn't matter. Okay? Alright. <sighs> one day, one day I will be able to do nothing, but here's how awesome fandom is stories. I hold out hope. Let us whisper of a dream. If you enjoyed this episode and the app that you're listening to me on allows you to rate either this episode or the podcast in general, especially if you're listening to me on Apple Podcasts, please, please rate this up, this podcast. It helps out a lot. It tells the algorithm to share me with more people. If you've got a dollar you can throw my way, please in the show notes, you'll see a link that says Anchor Community Support. If you click that, you can give it the $1, $5, or $10 levels. That money helps me to do everything that I do. If you want to connect with me, I'm C.E. Dorset on Twitter. And you can find a link to that and all of my other social media over at projectshadow.com. Like I said, I'm currently recording the audiobook for Crucify My Love. And hopefully I will have more news on that soon. And yeah, hopefully I'll be done with that process soon. But until next time, have the fun.